<coughs> it doesn't, I mean, discussion can come at any time. It doesn't have to only come at this oh, time. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Sally, Sally. Sally's got a question here. She got in ahead of everyone else. Just to draw out what you were just talking about, I often think about when does a seed that's germinating ah. become a plant? When does a seed that's germinating become a plant? And what have you concluded, Sally? <laughs> So this, this, this is one of the objects of investigation, one of the classic objects of investigation. So what comes first? The seed, right? And what comes next? Flow. Flow comes. Germination. So in the germination, which we call sprout. I mean, that's how it's discussed, right? Gompo? Yes, he knows this one. So Gompo, when would you say, does the seed change into a sprout? What happens to the seed when the sprout, like how do we process this? Not putting you on the spot or anything, but um, you might've heard this teaching before. If the, seed, if the seed is the substantial cause seed of the substantial sprout, cause, substantial cause of the sprout, then the seed ceases to exist when the sprout comes into being because the substantial cause and the result cannot exist simultaneously. Okay. So cause and result. So one thing just to say, Venerable Gompo has said that the seed is the substantial cause. We could say main cause, right? But what, without that, there'd be, no other, there'd be no plant. But there are other conditions for that plant to arise other than seed. I could have, and I have actually at the moment, quite a few seeds because I've been Googling the seed bank and how to, and Venerable Yeshi, who's a horticulturalist, and saying, well, I haven't been Googling her. I've been saying... Can you tell me when I need to plant my seeds, you know? So the seeds are still there. There's no sprouts appearing. Why? Because it needs certain other conditions. It needs the warmth. She said, wait till beginning of September, I think, or wait till the end of this month. I will check in with her again and say, is it warm enough yet? Is it warm enough yet? All right, because I've got all these seeds wrapped up in my fridge in, like she has, wrapped up in, um, in um, tissue paper, in containers, it's exactly what she's doing down there at Tushy House. You open the fridge door and there's like a scientific experiment in there, which is called a seed bank. Anyway, so this is my first year of seed banking. It's very exciting because I've never done it before, but I have an expert on site, so thankfully, otherwise I wouldn't know what to do next, though I did Google that. Right, so seed is the substantial cause. So we have cause, and result, right? The result is the sprout, the plant. So at some point in that transformation, seed, sprout, seed, sprout, seed, sprout, right? And then we have the fully ripened result of sprout. That's what Gompo is saying, right? Correct? Fully ripened result. But we also need these other contributing conditions, don't we? We need the warmth, the soil, water, sunlight, so whatever else we need, and absence of bush turkeys. <laughs> and absence of bush turkeys. Just saying, okay. <laughs> or some pretty heavy duty impenetrable wire. Yeah, in this property, yes, Rachel. When it comes to the sprout, is it no longer the seed? Yes, because now it's a sprout. Can you see as once it's sprout, sprout, <laughs> and the sprout sprouts, where's the seed? So you'd have to say there's the potential sprout within the seed, potential for sprout within the seed. So it's the same with our, our karma, isn't it? 
we talk about it as seeds on the mental continuum, but unless all those conditions arise, it's never going to sprout. Is that what you were saying down there, Eva? Uh, Before the seed became a seed, it was something else. What was the seed before a seed? Oh, gosh. What? Gametes. A flower that then seeded. The flower dies, the seed forms. The forms. So we've got a botanic lesson here happening. The, the egg. So someone online was saying something? It was the, it was, uh, the gametes. Gametes. The male What's and the female gametes. A male and female gametes. They have to fertilize. It has to be a fertilized seed. So everything's it is a flower. So there's a, a, a infinitum of dependent arisings here. Constantly causes and results, causes and results, moment, 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 moment. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, Carolyn, right? The labels just keep changing and Eva. It, but is it the labels? It's, it's, you've got to think this, the entity yeah. is changing. So this is the recognising the impermanence, the transformation, that nothing is just what it is either. So that's one way of thinking. The object changes before the label changes. Okay. Definitions of how do you f define sprout, Gompo? So doesn't it come back to in each stage of what we're talking about, what, what definitions we're using to refer to these things? For example, yes. in legal terms, in legal a fetus terms. is a fetus until 24 weeks and then it becomes a baby. Yes. But in Buddhist terms, it's, it's a person from the point of conception. So it depends upon what set of definitions you're using to label these things. Yes. So the labels are labeled dependent on your views, dependent on the law saying, like the fetus. Did you hear? So the fetus in legal terms, and then there's, you know, like at what point, I don't know, it gets complicated, what point abortions can happen or not happen. In the Buddhist terminology, Never. I mean, which is a challenge to me as a 70s feminist, you know. It's just like, oh gosh, got to rethink that whole thing. But anyway, now I don't need to worry. <laughs> Sally. Uh, don't we draw lines around things? We draw lines around things. Yeah, and then we call it something. And then we call it something. And we label it something. And in fact, not only do we draw lines around things and we label it something, this is an example I like. One lama said, you know, we draw a picture of a lion and then we get scared of the lion we've drawn, right? So this is, I was thinking about this in the break time, the creativity of our imagination and then we believe our imagination. So this is getting to we are the creator. And I think all of this conversation is we are the creator of our own experience of our own world. So I was thinking about an instance when at Copan Monastery. And one of the guys was freaking out because during meditation, he had a experience of his death. It wasn't a meditation on death. So you could say you were distracted to the wrong object because that wasn't a meditation on death. It was a distraction. However, he became overwhelmed by this distraction and people can do that, can't they, in meditation? Become, I'm looking at Rachel because she's teaching mind, mindfulness to the whole world, it seems. Oh, she's going corporate. It's, it's wonderful, you know, get all those corporates watching their breath and whatever else calming their minds, you know, dealing with this crazy world. So, so he got terrified of what his mind created, which was a premonition of his own death or an experience of his own death. I mean, we know we're all going to die, right? And death could come any time. We all know all of those things. So you could say on the one hand, well, that was a useful lesson. 
but he got so caught up in that. He was terrified that this was reality, that it was actually a premonition of his death. And so um, then Venerable Karen came in and said, well, you've just got a very creative imagination. Simple. Well, maybe not simple, but that's what we do. So we become terrified of things that we've created. Or we become anxious about things that we've created. We get angry at things we've created. We desire things we've created. Yes? We live in a storied world. We live in a storied world. We have our own narratives. But if everything is our mental construction and social construction. Mental construction and social construction. And this is, this, both of those um, are very interesting in terms of we, we didn't go into about views. So we have these different views or conceptions. So, um, so we acquire ideas. Well, first of all, this view of the self, isn't it? That we're born with that. That baby, John or otherwise, still had a strong sense of me. I mean, the animals have that. You don't have to be human to be able to intellectualize that, to have a strong sense of self. Every being has a strong sense of self. So we say this is innate, it comes with the package. We're born with it. So this innate grasping at having a self, right? And that's the one we're addressing with this wisdom, realizing emptiness. So addressing that root ignorance, the root. I'm thinking sprout and I'm thinking, where do the roots fit in? So my, the roots come after the seed, don't they? And now I'm like, <laughs> there's the seed and then there's the roots. And the, huh? The leaf sprouts. The leaf sprouts. Okay. So anyway, there's, you've got to remove it, root and branch or whatever. You've got to remove it from the root and then you've removed it all. Right. Um, so where were we? And then there's the, it's, it's called like the ones through, through learning, we could say in this life, intellectually acquired beliefs. Usually in the context of some particular, like you might have a particular spiritual belief, a belief in God, a belief in the power of the universe, a belief in I don't know what. The things your family teach you. All your things your family teach you. A belief that your parent is God until you get to what age? They stop being the center of your universe? Seven or something? Is it before then? Anyway, I can't remember child psychology. I've never studied child psychology, but I remember reading about it. Any, any psychologists? Who's a psychologist? Yeah, so when do you start to stop? It depends who your parents are. It can happen soon. Oh, yeah, you can read these. So, um, Kate. Oh, yeah. Come on, Kate. What do you say? Nothing. All right. Seven. I knew Piaget was all I could remember. Probably, <laughs> Piaget's probably been it's superseded. Around seven. Around seven. Around seven, depending on who your parents are. <laughs> it's all causes and condition. Again, it's not some, some fixed thing that says it will happen at seven years because look what's happened to psychology over the, you know, positive psychology has blown it all out of the water, isn't it? Total different framework. And the thing is for our minds to adjust to those different frameworks rather than saying, oh, that's wrong because this is what I studied 40, 50 years ago, you know. Okay, so what else? Also, the theory of mind coming to realise that other people have different ideas of their own. Yes. Which is not in and of itself a problem. It's just when those ideas conflict with our ideas and we're not able to relinquish that. Because, in fact, how do we learn? By having different ideas, different perspectives, and we learn from each other. Otherwise, we all just think the same thing and we don't learn a thing. 
very depressing, isn't it? Okay, any other points of discussion? Otherwise, we'll go on with the very... Um, we still on session one? Yes. <laughs> any, any other points that people wanted to raise? Anyway, Rachel. Well, the trickiest thing about this for me at the moment is just trying to hold what feels like a contradiction somehow that on the one hand, there's no um, self that I can point you to. Where is the self? Ah, that's that what we're coming to. to. Yes. And, and, but then on the other hand, that there's calm, there's calm exceeds. I don't know. If it's yes. Quite the right language, yeah, but it's, a, it's correct language. Kind of like yeah. They're not the only seeds. No. They're my seeds. So mm. There's not me, but there's my seeds. Yeah. So I just find that a bit tricky. Yeah, it is very tricky. So yeah. this, so um, what um, Rachel's pointing to is exactly this bit coming up scope of our investigation. So that we know that we, we don't inherently exist, but we still exist. And our karmic seeds that are our karmic seeds exist on our mental continuum. They are not permanent aspects of our mental continuum because we can in fact eliminate those. We can, like what would you do with a seed, vaporize it or something? Um, burn it. Burn it is a good one. So we talk about that in terms of purification, burning off these karmic seeds. So this is possible. The ones we don't want, we can, we can purify them, which means the ones we don't want don't ever happen to ripen. The trickiest one, of course, is this root ignorance because it's already, it's like pervasive wherever we exist. So as all the great lamas have said, well, ever we're in samsara while ever we're in this conditioned body-mind continuum of whatever manifestation, whether it be an animal, whether it be human, whatever, whatever, wherever we live and so forth, we will have these afflicted states of mind. And now we're having rumbles outside and we just got to check it's not a rumble inside because, yeah, no, that is thunder. Okay. A potential challenge, external challenge. Okay. So, um, see you tomorrow, guys, just in case. <laughs> oh, just in case it goes off. Yeah. Who said that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, just in case. Uh, oh, no, so far, so good. We're doing very well. And we're still on the dongle. Go, the dongle. Go Rachel's dongle. <laughs> Keep it, keeping, us, keeping us all connected. Her dongle's more stable than we are. So, that's fantastic. <laughs> That's what we need. Wouldn't it be good? I'll just become a dongle. Oh, Sarah's back. Sarah's back. Yay. Hola. Hey. Hola. I just wanted to clarify or just to ask um, about the seed and the sprout. When you say that there was like a constant of dependent arising uh, causes and conditions or events, can you call the whole cycle um, constant or the continuum as a cycle? Like um, in a circular event like a, a continuity yes a continuity can you see as a i don't know i'm trying to give it like a continuity it could be a line or it could be a or it could be a, a cycle well, i guess in terms of samsara we do do a circle don't we circle yeah um we do do a, a circle but it's not But so you use, I mean, if we're talking about, for example, continuity of mind, that continuum, sometimes the analogy is, it depends what the um, phenomena is, I think. So that's like a stream of consciousness. We have that in our language, right? That continues on and on and on and on and on. If we were to investigate that stream, is any particular, can we grab hold of any particular moment? Because it's already passed once we have. But nonetheless, there is that continuity. Right. One moment arising from the previous moment, previous moment, life, death, next life, next death, etc. back there, forward there. So there is a continuum, a continuity. If we're Will you visualize as a line, like from the Buddhist perspective, that continuity of the well, mind? Sometimes, whatever works for you. Sometimes it okay. might be line. Sometimes it might be stream. 
I mean, I'm just looking at the lights here, which is so far functioning quite well. Um, and when the storms get strong, we see it flickering, right? But the rest of the time, we see con continuity of light. But it's an alternating current, which means that it's constantly going like this. But I don't know if it's thanks to Edison or somebody since then that we experience it as a continuity rather than like this, because we'd all be pretty ADHD, you know, if it was just going flicker, 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 you know, the strobe effect. But we experience as one continuity intellectually, even though we know that it's not a continuity, right? So there are some things like that. Whatever, you can use whatever works for you. Knowing yeah, that so sometimes when I think in like in a circle, I think like I'm going to pass for the same moment again, like I'm going to repeat. Well, if I visualize a line, like a continuum of moments in a line, maybe not coming back. I don't know. It's just just me. <laughs> That's how I visualize yeah, it. Well, you can investigate that. I mean, you'll never experience the same moment again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's why the circle sometimes confuses me. Like, yeah, I know. It all, it's all confusing. <laughs> but <laughs> we're working at unconfusing it, aren't we? That's what we're discussing here, how to unconfuse it. Uh, let me yeah, see. right. Okay. All right. So um, shall we continue on with our investigation of, of this? So before we do, just thinking, okay, so... Just a little bit of our... Uh, you tell me when we need a break. We've now been going an hour, including the whatever. Um, yeah. So let's just do about 10 minutes and have another break, and that will be the last break. All right. <clears throat> yes. I see, yeah, okay. But, um, is there something to be said for the, the rate of arising that our perception can see? Is there something to be said for the rate of arising that our perception can see? Yes. That, that's such that as you maybe become more like, or you become more alert, maybe you can see all things unfolding so rapidly like that. Yes, they say that. Um, one of the lines that immediately jumps to mind. So Rachel is saying, when you become a Buddha, the things you could see everything that is beyond that is hidden to our perception because it's too quick or or so forth. So, um, so it's said, you know, your holy body is as quick as thought. Right. So thought is like you know, light years. It's in fact, if we if, even though we can't see the quickness of thought, we can see in, um, well, at least you encounter the teachings over and over of someone like His Holiness Dalai Lama, Lama Zoparumpasho, all these precious lamas, and they're light years ahead of us. And it's like you can see where we might get fixed in a certain attitude, and this is the thing, one of the things, we get fixed in a certain attitude, like one of mine might be, what a Buddhist nun should sit like when she's teaching, right? Just a demonstration. Uh, and um, But His Holiness the Dalai Lama, of course, actually on that one, I wasn't even thinking that one, but he was saying, no, give me an armchair. I want to just sit on an armchair, you know? Um, you know, we have a perception that like here in the Gompa, we've got people sitting on the floor on cushions. We've got people sitting on, you know, the setup. I think everyone's been here who's on Zoom um, at the tables with the, I mean, on chairs with the tables in front. Um, but, you know, I was going to say none of us are Asian, but actually that's not true. <laughs> Were you brought up in Asia, Eva? Yes. Were you brought up sitting on the floor? No. No. She was brought up sensibly in a chair. Yeah. Exactly. She, she's not sitting on the floor. So we persist in this. I mean, there are reasons in meditation 
but we've adopted this system, we don't have to continue it. In fact, the Dalai Lama says, there's nothing inherently magical about Tibetan ritual or Tibetan this or that, you know? Don't be like a Tibetan, be like the Westerner you are. So I think, you know, we have to look at, at, at that, those constrictions, not quite sure where I'm going with this, but um, it did relate to something a minute ago. <laughs> Yeah. Like, oh, it was the hidden. Right? Like, yes. You know, I, we talked about how the more we become mindful, the more capable we are of, of noticing something rather than noticing the, uh, the consequences of our behaviour long after we've done it. Yes. We start to become more capable of noticing while we're doing that or the impulse before the act. So it's like even at the basic level. Yes, right? correct. It's like you start to. Yes. So this is this is developing clarity. So what, um, which is all what this wisdom is about, developing clarity. So in the mindfulness that Rachel teaches in, and people have commented that, in, um, rather than seeing um, the cons consequences of their actions after the effect, is realizing what the consequences will be before the actions arisen. Right. And so, therefore, making a decision based on your wisdom, um, which we can say wisdom of prior experience and so forth. Yes, this is one of the ways of developing um, clarity at that. So, so, this can come along in the, you know, when we talk about um, in the foundation of all good qualities, having pacified distractions to wrong objects, in other words, having pacified the mind, once I have pacified distractions to wrong objects and correctly, and so the pacification comes through the calm abiding, single point and concentration meditation practice. We say that makes your mind serviceable. But if you look at the nine, and if you look at the nine stages of shamatha calm abiding, in the process of that, a whole bunch of um, levels of clairvoyance come along. Now we've got lightning as well. Anybody else having lightning? Unbelievable. <laughs> that was thunder. You can't hear lightning. Thank you. Did somebody else say that? Thank you. See what I learned? That was thunder. You know, when I was a kid, did anybody else get that? The thunder was the gods playing 10-pin bowling. <laughs> you got that? Graham got that. So it was good because you just thought of these gods up there. It was so, I guess, so we didn't get scared. I'm not talking. About Chucking their hammers about. Thor's hammer. Yeah, Thor's hammer. A bit Germanic, radio. Anyway, it worked. I just thought it was cute, the gods up there playing playing 10 pin bowls and so then I didn't freak out. See, it's all dependent arising. So there you go. Um, what were we saying? Where were we? Yeah, clarity, our, developing. Our awareness starts to track more in line with the unfolding things. Yeah, so we, be, we cultivate awareness that is more in sync with reality. So that's what we're, that's where we're going. All right. Once I have pacified distraction to wrong objects and correctly analyze the meaning of reality. So that's where we're up to. How do we do this? Okay. What is the scope of investigation? Sorry, we're still on session one. Well, I'm not sorry because I think this is valuable, right? Because actually it covers, you know, I mean, we could be doing this for years. I'm modifying next month. It might be more combination of meditation and more of this because no way I'll get to session six tomorrow. And session five is not there, so it's a hidden phenomenon. So if I keep it hidden, you won't even know what it is. <laughs> okay, scope of investigation. All right. This comes up in the Heart Sutra. The principal ignorance or self-grasping is in relation to our personal self. To investigate the nature of such a self, the Buddha defined these five areas. So... We talk about 
to self of person, me, I, or another person, but it's usually me, I, and then self of phenomena, right? The two, two, point, two areas of investigation. So, so far we've been focusing mainly on this sense of self because we have to identify how that exists and what it is and so forth. And then the self of phenomena is traditionally taught on the basis of, because we could investigate any phenomena that exists in the whole world, but on the basis of what we impute that self on, which is this body plus the mind, all of this. So this comes up in the Heart Sutra that we were, everything is in the Heart Sutra. So the essence, so the Heart Sutra, just to segue slightly, Oh, yeah, I wanted to read from here. So this Heart Sutra, we talk about this being the essence of the perfection of wisdom sutras. So last time, those who were here, Bodhicitta, the practices of the six perfections culminate in the perfection of wisdom. This is where we're at, right? We're at that one. So all of these other perfections, the perfection of wisdom sutras, which is what the Buddha taught in the second turning of the wheel, right? So the whole 80,000 and so forth, there are even more extant that have, um, some have ceased to exist. And so 80,000 and then condensed into 20,000 and then the most condensed, the Heart Sutra, or even those four lines, the very most condensed of the essence of the perfection of wisdom sutras. So I just wanted to read this from um, Geshe um, Nundra Zopa Rinpoche, who's, who was, because he's passed away, one of um, uh, Lama Zopa Rinpoche's, for example, teachers, uh, he was at Deer Park in, um, is Seattle the state? What's the state? I'm oh, sorry. Over there in America, Deer Park, Minneapolis. Anyway, he was there. Okay. Sort of, Seattle's there and you go over here. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> On the map. <laughs> How do you? Huh? Turn left at Seattle. I think it's turned right at Seattle. Anyway, over there. Um, so I just want to read this quote. After Buddha attained enlightenment, okay. All right, so first of all, I want to go back to, uh, so this is a quote from the Fundamental Treatise on the Middle Way, Nagarjuna. So Nagarjuna, so this is the, we're looking at the wisdom aspect. So we, last module, we're looking at the, um, the vast, and this is called profound. So the vast, when we're looking at the uh, um, field of merit and visualizing that. So we have Maitreya and Arya Sangha and so forth all around here. We were looking at that last time, seven point cause and effect, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This time we're looking at the profound, the deep end of the pool. So Manjushri and all of that around that. So Nagarjuna is probably the most um, go to, it's certainly the most go to for us in terms of the middle way consequence school of, of the middle way present, presentation of the middle way, third century or second century, second, third, one of the Nalanda masters. So we've got the Nalanda masters garden here. We've got Nagarjuna here, just down there. <coughs> and um, the, we, so here we have, I'll just mention this as a by, by, by the way, we've got the Nalanda garden with um, 
currently there's six ornaments and two supreme ones, so eight plus Lamas on Kappa. And there's actually the, the whole party of early scholars, Indian scholars, is, uh, includes um, 17 Nalanda Pandits, right? So Nagarjuna was one of these. And then also Chandra Kirti, who's not one of these that we're here, but coming along, I guess she's going to have us all, we're going to have all of them. We're going to have Lama Ritisha up here. And I uh, guess she's on a roll, right? With all of this. So, um, and then Chandra Kirti gave a commentary about this. So these are in terms of the go-tos and then Lama Song Kappa brought it all together for us too, because, you know, by now your brain hurts, right? Um, no, I mean, then came, sorry, in the middle, Atisha, John Tompa, Geshe Potawa, the Kadampa masters, and then Lama Tsongkhapa, anyway, that whole lineage. It's in this wisdom lineage. After the Buddha attained enlightenment, he did not teach for a period of seven weeks. He went to a place near Varanasi and remained silently by himself. The fact that the Buddha did not teach demonstrates how rare and difficult to understand these teachings. Because Nagarjuna says, having understood that those with weak intelligence would have difficulty realizing the depths of his teaching, the Buddha's mind turned away from teaching the Dharma. So he did all these practices and so forth and for those seven weeks. And the first words the Buddha spoke about emptiness indicated his opinion that nobody would understand it. If you're feeling in that boat right now, Welcome to the Buddha's time. Profound, so this is what he said. Profound, peaceful, free of elaboration, radiant, unproduced. I found a truth like nectar. No one I teach this to will understand it, so I will not speak about it. I will hide in the forest. And indeed, he didn't speak about it for some time, but this then was the second turning of the wheel, Rajagriya, Vulture's Peak. So when we look at the Heart Sutra, what page was it? 232. It says, Thus did I hear at one time the Bhagawan was dwelling on Massa Vulture's Mountain in Rajagriya together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. Anyone been to Rajagriya? Who's been to Rajagri? Sally? Where did they all fit? Where did they all fit? You go to Vulture's Peak, it's teeny tiny, isn't it? You go up there. Anyone else been to Rajagri? It's a small, windy place. And so they were Arya beings. They were in the, apparently up in the sky. Buddha could see them. And maybe they could see each other. They probably could if they were up in the sky. So they were pretty highly realized beings already and then getting these, these teachings. And it's a thing that continues to this day. They say, don't introduce the topic of emptiness to those who aren't ready to hear it. Because why? Why as we we're talking this morning, you could very dangerously develop, particularly this nihilistic view of nothingness and get all despairing, depressed and not a good space to be in or it reinforces this internalism. But I think our main danger is this nihilism one, you know, which is nothing matters, nothing exists. So there is that, um, was that what Sartre was on? It's existentialist view? Anyway, I can't remember back then. I was about 14 at the time of reading Sartre. I can't remember, but I was pretty much into Sartre. Anyway, so it's gotta be, it has to be within this package of us understanding, but that at the point we're getting to here is when it talks about no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness. Again, it's not saying we don't exist, no inherently existent body. So these are our points of investigation. So if you haven't given up on the outline, um, bottom of page one, <laughs> the, 
these five areas are the five aggregates. So the body or material form, if we're looking at our body or material form, is an object of investigation. The body is made up of all these different factors, my body that I experience as a whole, and this is the investigation of the parts, you know, we talk about, and particularly like, this is very, um, I just realized my 10 minutes more became 15. We can't go anywhere it's raining? Yeah. Okay. Unless someone would like to go up top of my veranda and get my towel in out of the rain. <laughs> Do we need a leg stretch? What was that? Okay, we're having a pippy break here. So can we take um, 10 minutes? Huh? 10 minutes, okay? So we're going to take a break till three o'clock, just as we're poised on that, but thinking about the five aggregates and we're investigating that. Yeah, people are needing to stretch their legs and go to pee-pee break, okay? So see you at three. Do we... Um okay, we're just gonna be mute at this end. So if you wanna keep chatting amongst yourselves, unmute yourself and have a discussion. Okay, so we're back online, folks. Um, yep. If you've had enough, just some, check. People thumbs up. They can hear us. Got a thumbs up. Is there a thumbs up? Is there anybody who can hear us? Yep, all gone. Everyone. Oh, there we go. Someone's come back. Yes, Tim's there. Tim's there. You hear us, Tim? Yep. Okay. Ready to? Is that enough of a break, folks? Here, everyone's enjoying the social connection from a compassionate distancing, which is a good thing because that's part of what it's all about building our Dharma Buddies community. So, we're going to discuss with Eva tomorrow whether we continue on our Dharma Buddies Dharma Jewels group beyond the end of the year. So, we'll look at some options different form, what forms it could take, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so, all right. So it's a bit of head space as well as body space. All right, so we're at this scope of investigation of the five aggregates, which is aggregates, aggregation, um, coming together of collections that make the body and mind. 
And so this is to investigate what is the nature of this self anyway, this me, this I, what, you know, what is its nature? So um, in one of the discussions, it was sort of like, well, you know, um, the body is something that's self-evident to us. So it's an easy, hopefully easy point of um, investigation. And we've got to look at that. We spend a hell of a lot of time looking after this body, focusing on the body. In fact, there's a whole probably population that only looks after the body, <laughs> isn't there? Um, we cherish it, we pamper it and we so forth. So, but when we're engaging in this investigation, we're, we're investigating the nature, what is the nature? So we look at it from different angles. So we look at it, um, someone saying hello to someone? What was that? Okay, it's recording, yep, all good. Okay, so um, the body in terms of uh, the matter that makes up our body, so the earth element of the body making up the skeleton and the nails and the hair and the teeth and, you know, the hard bits of the body. Muscle is usually included in there. The wart, wart oh, oh, and then we also think about that, dependent interdependence with the earth element outside of ourselves that it's not a the body is not like have you noticed the body is not like we regard it as having a boundary isn't it but does it have a true boundary the body and this is part of the investigation of the elements because okay on the earth element we could say to some extent but even the uh, the level of the skin we know if you watch all those forensic programs that we're leaving traces everywhere all the time you know every time you rub up against something apparently all these dead um what do you call them cells cells of skin um and, you know, after a while in the house, you know, dust accumulates or so forth. So that from shedding, isn't it, from bits of our body. So we're not quite as defined as we think. And then we look at something like the water element, clearly even less defined, you know, because we sweat out and now we've got water droplets in the air that are spreading COVID. Oh, no, it's not water. Now it's aerosol. It's hard to keep up. But, you know, there's no, it's not like contained, but we have this sense of containment. So this is another one to investigate the water element and all the aspects of water element in our body, our saliva, our blood, everything liquid in the body. I have to say, you know, sometimes like, when you're with a person who's died and the liquids that come out when you move them after they've died, it's quite a lot. There's a lot, you see a hell of a lot of liquid coming. I mean, even the process of dying, but afterwards, even they haven't been eating and drinking for a long time, there's still a lot. Are we 80% water or are we something percent? A big percent. And yet probably our sense of ourselves is not that, is it? I'm sort of, unless you're a watery, what is it? Aquarium, is it? I don't know. <laughs> I feel a bit more solid than water. Feel a little bit more solid than water. I feel quite a bit more solid than water. I mean, that's where, as I said, you know, when the meditators start realizing they've got to grab because this sense of self fades away. And even, even you say, well, I haven't realized emptiness, but sometimes people in meditation, they say, my body disappeared. The body was still there. I'm just like to say, you know, when someone says that, your body is still here, by the way. Um, but our sense of that corporeality that requires some sensation of density of the body has gone because maybe you relax more than, and so the muscles are more relaxed. And so you've got a sense of I've disappeared in not a good way. Right. Um, air, uh, fire, the warmth of the body, the inner warmth, the air, and then, you know, that is also a continuum, different parts of our body, warm, cool, so forth. It's dependent on the elements. So it's all of a sudden, last night, well, some of us, like, I mean, 
I'm usually one of the people who comes into the gompa and sits in front of the heater during cool times, right? And then last night, one of the other nuns came in and said, it's winter, it's cold. And we're all like, including myself, I'm going, no, it's not. It's all a relative thing because the external warmth. So we're all, you know, we see that independence, no, no problem there. Um, and uh, the air element. So this is a whole area of investigation, the breath, obviously. And the breath, we're, I mean, we're all breathing the same air here, folks. I just want to put my mask on again. <laughs> But it makes you think, doesn't it? What, and this is how we get this virus. You know, I was thinking, or I've been saying actually, because I was thinking to myself, you know, we've got these rules in New South Wales, these ones in Victoria, these ones in regional areas, metropolitan hotspots and so forth. And just like, tell the air, this is your boundary. I don't think the air is going to take any notice, is it? Jumps the boundary. If you think about it. Of course, we put the preventative measures. Don't get me wrong. I'm not against every preventative measure there is. But uh, yeah, so I think that's pretty self-evident. But we investigate all these um, ways in which we exist. So this is purely on the basis of the elements of the body. And there's a whole analysis that um, you can read about. Uh, I think it's uh, session fall which we probably won't elaborate on but it goes through all of that we ask you know we interrogate which of these if any are truly me now, i found it very useful when i was um well i wasn't thinking as a buddhist then but when i went to theater school paris in the, of the 80s late 70s can't remember early 80s 1980 and it was a physical theatre school. So we did focus a lot on the body and you had to like embody in your training, being this element, being that element, colours, all sorts of things. So it was really very obvious that your experience of your body can change by whatever you focus on, right? Just, we're just talking body at this point. So if I think I have a heavy body or a light body or this or whatever, you know, and this comes along in the next module. I can still say that for one more module. <laughs> one more module face to face. Where we talk about, you know, um, in, in Tantra, about visualizing, particularly in high yoga Tantra, as the deity, visualizing the form as a different form, you know, visualizing like this, you know, I am Chen Rezi. No, this is not to be um, actually done. Uh, unless you have an empowerment, so I won't go there. Um, but just getting a sense of, we do have the meditations that we've done, like purification ones, where you do, you visualise the light coming in and your body becoming like crystal and so forth. Not like crystal, but that clarity, that light, that softness, our mind, that spaciousness and all sorts of things, because the other one, have we got there, space? No, space, the other element. Okay, so that's one way of analysing. That's the first of what is called these aggregates, these bits that make up the body and mind, the actual form. And when we looked at the 12 links, we have the form and then we say name because we give the name. That's what we were discussing before. We name that, but we have the other aggregates in that. Um, if anyone can remember that particular link, it's like you've got the boat and then you've got the others within it, which is all the aggregates anyway. So the pictorial thing, is it still out there? The one out there fell down, but um, that one, I'm not sure. And anyway, the 12 links of dependent arising, which relates of course to all of this as well. So then we have feelings, which is physical sensations, pleasant, unpleasant. So this rules the senses you know, going towards the pleasant, going away from the unpleasant. It makes sense to do that. And neutral sensations, which is, it's neither pleasant nor unpleasant. In other words, it hasn't got my intention, so I'm quite indifferent to it. So this we're doing all the time. And on the basis of that, we make judgments. So, you know, we could think of ourselves as a pleasant person, or, but it's not that. What this one is, is about 
been, well, we are pleasure seeking, <laughs> isn't it? We want to have, we want to be happy, we want to be comfortable. So just now we had a little stretch break and a pippy break, which means hopefully we feel much more pleasant now, right? We've relieved the stresses of the unpleasant. Um, so uh, we can see how our experiences are formed by different sensations, right? Different sensations on the basis of the body and on the basis of our sensory engagement with sight, sound, smells, taste, touch, so the sensual, right? And maybe for most people, that's where it stops. Isn't it? Because it's about sensory pleasure. I'm looking for happiness. It's all out there. And if it's all out there, it is on the basis of the senses. But then we investigate more deeply. And this is where the next of these five aggregates, these five rivers, these five areas um, of investigation, perceptions or discrimination. It's the capacity of our mind to discriminate between this and that, me and you, object, subject, and objects in space. So it's an intelligence that we have to be able to discriminate different things. This is what we, you know, we use. And on the basis of that, we distinguish objects. And we distinguish the object from the space around the object or one object from all the other objects in the space and so forth and so forth. So this capacity which we can also talk about our different perceptions, you know, how, how we actually perceive. Because, you know, as the eye sense power, only seeing form and color. And then, of course, we have the mental elaborations on that. So then we get to volitional formations, sometimes called karmic formations, which is all the other mental factors that arise so again, in the 12 links, this is shown as a, as a potter making all these different shapes, isn't it? So this is what our mind does, makes all these different shapes out of things, makes all these, you know, beautiful objects and maybe even pretty ugly objects as well. Um, so these are the mental states that arise that are direct our actions, that everything, and then as the Buddha said, or as an ordinary being in samsara, or every single one of our actions is propelled by these mental states that are totally confused, contaminated, wrong, deceptive liars. Sounds depressing, doesn't it? But this is our totality of our experience. Yes? We can think about that. We can investigate that. So, for example, this guy who had the fear of death because he meditated and created this with his own mind. I mean, it's good to have fear of death, on the other hand, if you can transform it. And I think Graham, we're having a conversation at lunchtime about Graham's success, I hope it doesn't mind me saying, in transforming problems into opportunities, relabeling that label of problem as opportunity. Because we do have wholesome fear and the whole teachings, like Lama Zop has written a book about wholesome fear. And it's, it, it's really about practicing the five powers. And that we talk about practicing these five powers at the time of death. So we can say the fear of death can be turned to a wholesome thing of, yeah, Hello, I am going to die. How much time do I have? I have no idea, but I know my body's getting older. And should I even die of an old age? The old age is suddenly closer than it ever was, you know? And so how much time do I have can inspire us to practice. So, yeah, so the different and the different consciousnesses or awareness or ways of knowing, the sense powers, hearing, sight, seeing, hearing, smelling, taste, touch, thinking and thinking of course, so all the senses are direct perceivers. They see things directly, perceptually, and then the mind kicks in. So that's one way. But there is also the mental direct perception, which is 
when you realise emptiness, perceptually, there's no an, an ana analysis having to go on. In the meantime, we've got to use our capacity for analysis. It's not a bad thing. We use it. The fact that we can think, the fact that we can think about these things, we can consider these things, we can engage in analysis, we can engage in investigation, means we can develop this wisdom. If we couldn't, we couldn't do it. We just say, oh, well, that's just how it is. Better just wait to die. But we know that's not how it is. Okay. So these are areas of investigation to get a sense of the nature of the self, which is, is a combination of all of these things. And when we engage in a meditation on this, which we will subsequently, we start with that body, you know, am I my, this bit of the, my body or that bit of my body? Am I my head or brain? Because I think, am I my heart? I feel, you know, when we have a sense of I arising, where does it arise? You hurt me? Or we say, do we say, I love you? What is it in um, sign language, I love you? I. Oh, that's the old um, sign it's, English. I don't know what it is in Aussie. Gee, I watch them on telly all the time. Well, I watch them on the phone. <laughs> I love you. Huh? I, I love you. That's what it used I to be. I love you. Yeah, it's here. It's here. In Tibetan, I. cheetah. So, is cheetah Tibetan or is that Sanskrit? That's Sanskrit, isn't it? Cheetah, body, mind. Here, yeah, chitta, body, um, body, mind, heart, mind, same word, heart, mind, not heart, physical heart, chitta, um, heart, chakra, you know, somewhere in the center of the body. So my sense of I must be located there. If it was, you could have surgery. Oh, there you are. There I am. <laughs> Whatever. So we do the, all these investigations, the body. And then we investigate all these aspects of the mind, getting more and more subtle of where it is, where is this sense of I. The conclusion we get at the end of that is neither to be found in the body, neither to be found in the mind, neither to be found in the whole of the body and mind continuum, neither to be found as separate from the whole of the body continuum. And you go, well, if it's none of those, where is it? That's the point. If it is none of those, there's nowhere else it can be, right? If it's not one with or separate from, where else could it possibly be? Absolutely nowhere. So our conclusion is it's something the mind has made up. That's the conclusion we want to get to. But as the Buddha said, don't just take my word. You do the investigation. So we're like a spy going around. Who is this me who is meditating here? And then you go, oh, there's the me observing the me meditating. There's the me observing the me meditating. And you can go like crazy. <laughs> you can. <laughs> anyway, we try and get more and more subtle on that. Any questions, comments about that? Food for thought. Food for meditation, reflection, investigation, discussion. Okay. So what we're doing is just really freeing up our idea of holding on to this sense of me, trying to get a sense of the, um, the fact that it is an elaboration, a hallucination, an illusion. It's not to be trusted. It's a concealing liar. Okay. I actually think, you know, this whole fake truth thing, it's got something to it. It's like, yeah, it's all fake truth, mate. <laughs> Including your truth. Fake. <laughs> That's depressing. There is a way through it. Okay. Now, we'll just um, cover some of the points in relation to impermanence. Why? Because we talked about grasping at a permanent sense of self. Here... We've been looking, investigating a sense of self, not to get nihilistic, but to realise, oh, I do exist, but it's dependent on all of these things, but I don't exist how I think. But then 
Okay, so then looking at impermanence to counter this idea of a permanent, eternal me that gets shocked when somebody says, and by the way, you're going to die. Because what do we hear? This I is going to be annihilated. And that couldn't possibly. Okay. So I'm going to jump in right here because we've covered quite a bit of this in part two. So, so we talked before about this. We have an innate sense of self that we grasp at. Hence, we're born. Because we grasp at having a body. Hey, not mummy or daddy's fault. I wanted the body. I, I worked hard to get this body, right? The grasping at the time of death to existence, to coming into being. So here we are. Actually, we didn't do a bad job, really because we got all the best conditions. Great job. All right. So the subtle false ideas of self. So we oh yeah. So two. One is the innate. Two is the intellectually acquired, which might be all the stories I tell myself. You know, my education, my views, my all of that. That is the me of this life, the personality of this life, we can say. Okay, so we talked about you've learned through your family or opinions and philosophies and so forth. Mainly it's about philosophies. The subtler false ideas of self. Okay, so baby before John, baby, right? So even though... Even though we can say today, I'm not, I'm not a baby. I hope we can say that. Today, I'm not a baby. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder. Myself, right. <laughs> and we've got a sense of ourselves as a baby. Even our sense of ourselves as a baby, we can probably interrogate. Because I don't know about you, but I wouldn't have a clue except what I've been told. I mean, the first photos I remember of myself, I was more than a baby. Yeah, how come they weren't? <laughs> I see my brave, my brother in his little crib and my sister. Where was I? I think by the time I came along, my parents were sort of over baby photos. It depends where you are. It was just like enough baby photos already. You know, when my nephew had his, his first child, I think because I was caring for my mother at the time, um, Every day there were photos of the baby. And I thought, you're going to have a very big, I mean, it was electronically, I'm like, you're going to have a very big album very quickly. After about five days, it slowed down, you know. And then the second baby, it took a long time before any photos came. So that's what happens, right? It's not alone when you get to number whatever I was. One, two, three, four. Number four. Okay. So we have the sense of ourself, there's something, even though we can see, we can see the changes, we see the baby photos and I don't look like that anymore. We can see our changes throughout our life, adolescence, all of this, don't look like that anymore, don't look like that anymore. We can see the aging, we can see the transformation of the physical form and we maybe have a sense of the transformation of the mind, hopefully we do, otherwise, how come my parents paid for all that education? <laughs> Mm. No, we know that, that we have changed, but there's still that sense of I'm the same me, you know, isn't there? That we grasp onto this sense of me that was already always existing. Venerable Yangshan. Yes. I've gone this before and I found there's a book by Mingyo Rinpoche. A book by Mingyo Rinpoche? Um, the Joy of Living. The Joy of Living. And he actually explains how this delusion arises. I can't remember the details, but we get fooled because of all the sensory information coming in. We get fooled by sensory information? Yeah. Every, all the time? Yeah. But, yes. But that is... The sense of self. The sense of self comes from Yes, the because we, 
it, it's like we need that validation by the external, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, we might name that as uh, there's the sensory that tells me I exist. You know, without our senses functioning, just think, can I get a sense of existence? It'd be weird, you know, has anyone had a, well, I suppose. See, I'm not deaf. I think I've only experienced um, momentary deafness. Has anyone experienced a sense of not exist, not, you know, a sense, a sense not working? I mean, these days I keep smelling things to make sure my sense of smell, because they say if you've got COVID, you... so I just check. Yeah, I can still smell, just in case. <laughs> I know, yeah. It's all right. I got flowers. This is more subtle because I have to test my sense capacity if that's too strong. No, it's more subtle. I can smell it. It's all right. It's still, it's still okay. No temperature. No. I mean, all of those things are sensory, right? That tell us about our existence. So there is that sense of validation on the sensory level, apart from needing the validation in terms of the eight worldly concerns. In other words, validation by others, approving of us, admiring us, thinking well of us, all of that sort of thing. Um, so all of those things have a play, but we still have this sense there's something that hasn't changed. Is that correct? Do you still get a sense of there's something that's an essence of me that hasn't changed throughout this whole life? Or is that being knocked out of the water because you're a fantastic Buddhist? I age. Well, I age. <laughs> while I'm, I'm spending, I spend a fair bit of time with my elderly mother, and while I'm, when I'm with her, I get the sense like I'm still her daughter. So in that role, but she just keeps like when I ordain, she said, "I'm not calling you that." <laughs> you're still dead to me. Absolutely. I have friends who, not to my face, but still to each other, still call me by my, I mean, it's still my legal name because I figured I haven't sort of yet given up on the idea one day going to Tibet. Um, I don't know if I should say this on YouTube. Maybe I shouldn't, but, you know, and I've got to have an Anglo name and not wear these. And that probably won't happen in this lifetime, but it's nice to still have the passport. I think well, it's a point that's having a passport, isn't it, right now? Right now. <laughs> right now, but that can change, subject to change. Okay, so we've got that sense that something hasn't changed. So this innate sense of existence. And we also have these, you know, the misconceptions that come along like that with the root ignorance, obviously, being the, the most... Um, so this instinctual way of relating. So we have this sensory and, and thinking on the sensory level, when we do, um, and some of you I know are familiar with the um, process of the dissolutions at the time of death, but it's precisely that freak out of I am going out of existence because why? The earth element dissolves. This is where the elements are very useful. So, the, you know, we see it, observe it, you know. If, if somebody's dying over a period of time, you know, that you see the, the body shrink quite visibly, right? Um, and so, and we, even without that, even we're not dying, we have, when we fall asleep, we can have that sense of falling or um, being buried alive, or, you know, that sort of, so the earth element dissolving and then the water element and then everything drying up and then the fire element going by, then you're totally freaked out. Well, you're not hearing it. So the senses have gone to you, you're not hearing anything then. So the eye sense goes, you know, we, sit, we feel that when we're falling asleep, isn't it? When we're getting tired, we're not falling asleep, we're still pretending we're awake, but we're the eyes become blurry and at some point you go, you know what, I'm more asleep than awake, lights out. So, but, you know, does that freak us out? I was thinking, I'm so familiar with that, there's not a freak out. But then you think, how far can I go before it's a freak out? 
how far can my awareness go before it's a freak out? It's quite useful to contemplate, familiarize with and contemplate the stages of death as you're falling asleep or in a meditation um, so that at death time, hopefully we won't have that freak out. But, and then the mind goes, even before death, right? But the conceptual mind dissolves and the more, you know, grosser levels of conception and then more subtle levels of conception go. And it's, it's literally like my sense of me is dissolving completely, isn't it? I mean, maybe none of I mean, not having ever remembered dying before, but it'd be useful, wouldn't it? Because then you could access it all. But we can simulate, not, not actually die, but the, you know, because so great, so, so many holy great beings, so yogic beings who've had the lights on throughout that whole process and can tell you what it's like. And, you know, at some level, you've got to trust that this is what it's like, but some level, our experience will tell us that. We at least get the earth element one. Maybe we get the water element one. But that we familiarize with this experience of a dissolution of everything I feel is me. It's the impermanence of that. Rachel. The closest experience I can relate to that is I had an operation last year and I went under general. And there was that little, you know, it's like a moment, but between when they say, oh, you're okay, and it starts to count and the count and then right. And then, and just for a split second, you know, felt slipping away. So Rachel's talking about when she was having an operation and they gave her the anesthetic. Yeah. And there was, you know, when you're saying, what, countdown from 10 yes. or whatever. You never get there. You never get there. You know, Seven. Yeah, and grasping at seven, and then she was at lights out. But before lights out, it was like that sense of non-existence, or of fear, of of non-existence, fear of non-existence, or of letting go, of not having control. Actually, because guess what? We're not in control. <laughs> Did you notice, Graham? So in that process, sort of now that we're following. Um, a lot of people have um, friends around who are chanting um, various things while you're going through that process. Yes. Help. Yeah. So this is, you know, yes, as Graham's saying, you know, at at the time of actual death, to to yes, if you're a Dharma practitioner, in fact, if you're a Dharma practitioner, let your Dharma buddies know what your practices are. And or if you don't have a practice, then yes, chanting Om Mani Padme Hung and whatever mantras we can think of. Lama Sabha's written that whole book, How to Enjoy Death and Help Your Loved Ones Go Happily to Their Next Rebirth, which it says everything you need to know and way more in between about what practices you can do. You know, um, someone was playing yesterday there. Who was doing that? The old Mani Padme Hung, Lama Zopa. Someone was over here and they had Lama Zopa on their phone. Um, I'm in Padme Hung, and I thought about where my mother was dying, and and I do prayers and practices as she was, you know, she just there. And um, when I go to the loo, I put Lama Zopa in her ears, or when I went to sleep, I just put Gotcha, you're going to have Rupiche. <laughs> it wasn't it. Well, you don't know, yeah, the, uh, meditating on the, um, have the meditation playing on the dissolutions while you're dissolve, actually dissolving, dying, is a bit tricky because that, um, how, um, the, what stage you're up to is a bit trickier. And I know when Venerable Dronso was, was passing and at the beginning, you know, when she was conscious and she says, I think I'm in stage one now and, but then, you know, and then, she was not be able to articulate beyond that because you can't, you know, you get to a stage where you can't accept these yogis. That's why we've got this. Oh, now I'm doing stage whatever, because I've got control over the death process. Meantime, if we familiarize with it enough that it's at least familiar, even, even we're not conscious that it's like, it's not totally new, you know, the more we familiarize with anything. Yes. Yes, and we have that opportunity. Yes, so 
one thing is to um, learn that visualization and then just notice as you're going to sleep, how long can I keep the light of awareness on this to recognize any of this and then waking up the reverse process, coming back into this body, becoming embodied. And even when not familiar with those processes, it's quite interesting as you wake up to just look at that process of becoming more aware. It's very, I find that very useful, even being half asleep and not really going through the right processes, but becoming aware or becoming more aware as you, you know, eyes start to work and your ears start to work and things like that. Wonderful. Yep, as you see Geshe-la with more and more clarity. Fantastic. Wonderful. Okay. All right. So I'm trying to get to the bottom of the page. <laughs> I, I'm, const I'm not necessarily constrained by the page, but clearly I am. They're just points, right? We, and we can all read it too. So uh, getting a grasp on uh, impermanence. So the different levels of impermanence. There's the coarse level, a more subtle level, a more subtle level, and the more subtle that we can get would be fantastic. So the different ways that we grasp at this sense of self of being permanent, a self as an entity that doesn't change like an unchanging eternal soul or that me that's the same me as the baby, whatever we want to label it, the label doesn't matter. But that our sense of that, there's something, Atma. And it's got, you remember, the Buddha was in the context of the Hindu, Hindu tradition the Brahmin tradition and the Hindu tradition, where there was a sense of a soul and an atma, because anatma is <laughs> lack of that. Um, a self that changes on the surface, but somehow this core, yeah, my body's aged, everything's aged, but still underneath I'm the same. Now, maybe changing the mobile phone cover. I actually like the snake skin. You sort of shed one skin, you shed one skin, but you're still the snake. Anyway, whatever analogies that we can use that help us, a sense that changes constantly but still maintains the same identity, like a river. And this, particularly in relation to sense of identification with the mental continuum, is very useful. Because you can track back one way, but you know that that river of moments, if you analyze it, there's not one moment of that river that you can grab hold of, of any, like it's continually changing. So it, a river, I find, you know, the flow of the mind and coming back to the sense of we can never grab hold of a thought, right? As soon as we're aware of a thought arising, it's already passed. Have you ever had that experience? I'm sure you have where it's just like, I got it, aha, by the time, aha, it, it come, you know, by the time you're aware of, aha, it's like, it's gone. <laughs> that was so good. Like the great dream. Oh, that was such a fantastic dream. I wish I knew what it was. That was a great teaching Geshe gave me in the dream. Now, what was it? I have no idea. It was fantastic. But, you know, any sense that we can get of um, a continuity in other words, getting a sense that at a very subtle level, at a gross level, at every level, subtle, subtle, subtle. I mean, just on an investigation of the mind, we can go down to the cells and the, um, you know, the cells are dividing, disintegrating, all of this constantly. Now, I'm not aware of my cells doing all of that, but I can imply what I've learned to say this is happening. So we try and get a sense of that impermanent nature of myself, which means what I impute to be permanent, there's no foundation for that existing anywhere. So there's different angles that we can use. So in this sense of contemplation, oh yeah, there's some questions there. Maybe we'll look at the questions tomorrow. Contemplating impermanence, so the manifest level, birth, aging, sickness, death, this was a, in the first teaching of the Buddha, you know, first noble truth, the suffering of birth, suffering of aging, suffering of sickness, suffering of death. Okay, that's a big obvious thing. 
um, you know, within our lifetime, different phases of our life have a beginning, a middle and an end. And often in the Dharma teachings, they talk about, you know, practices that are useful at the beginning, like beginning to get me actually starting to practice or study. In the middle, when I've got a few practices and familiarity over under my belt, and then at the end. So everything's divided like that. So we can look at the stages within our life, you know, my baby, baby hood, beginning, middle and end, all a blur to me. But maybe in the toddler years, maybe I've got some sense of continuity that, you know, sort of different phases within the phases of your life. So trying to look at the different ways of this sense of a permanent me can be um, compartmentalized or broken up by time, t at times of my life. What is it? Seven stages of man. I can't know what the seven stages are. Seven stages. Anyway, it's there somewhere. Birth will be one and death will be the other. And they'll be aging in there somewhere. And in. Anyway. Beginning, middle and end. Um, rapidly. Changes happening rapidly, arising and ceasing within a short duration, like the arisal, abidance and cessation of anger or of any emotion. I think babies are great at this. You know, one minute they're crying, the next minute they're laughing their head off. It happens rapid succession, isn't it? And it doesn't seem to have the baggage of holding on to that previous one, you know. Whereas we as adults, we sort of hold on to that previous baggage as well. But this is such a helpful one to realise that anger, I am not an angry person, which is I've I inflated on, I've elaborated on top of what is there, what isn't there. I'm not an angry person because each day at the end of the day, when I do my budget suffer practice, did I get angry today? Well, absolutely not. So why do I keep thinking myself as an angry person? So we do a reality check, right? because I am not an angry person. I'm a person who experiences anger. I'm a person who experiences all sorts of gamuts of emotion, none of which is a permanent phenomena. None of them is a permanent phenomena. Correct? So it's... So what about things like kindness? When you say, um, someone says, oh, you're a kind person, you actually... Want that one to well, you do want it to stick around and you're very happy that someone perceives you as a kind person. I know for myself, I think, oh, I better be kinder then because they think I'm kind. No, it really, it does help, doesn't it? And because, yes, we can say that innately everything that is positive, you know, is in sync with reality and we want to cultivate those, absolutely. But then if I want to investigate, am I a kind person? Of course, I want to encourage that. I say, am I always kind? What about when I'm having those thoughts that are unkind that that person doesn't know about, so I'll just keep them to myself and work on it, isn't it? So, it, so there's not that, no fault in that because does your kindness or someone perceiving you as kind disturb your mind? No, no. keep going at it. So we've got to look at where it disturbs our mind because we want to get rid of these you might have this sense of i'm a really kind person and then somebody else comes along and goes you're the cruelest person i've ever come across no i'm not i'm a kind person so and so said so you know so the grasping at that being a kind person can be a danger but the kindness itself is not keep doing it sally um, this is not true that uh, to avoid to try and work towards avoiding cognitive fusion. Yes. That would be better to say, I'm a person who practices kindness. I, yes, I'm a practice person who. Think of others, not yes. As an angry person, but a person who's showing anger. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm a person who practices kindness. As the Dalai Lama says, my religion is kindness. So, yeah. Because that's a good reminder to practice kindness, isn't it? Eva? Uh, I think it's related to what Sarah, um, what Sarah found. 
Are they labeling to affect people's feelings about themselves? Yes. For example, uh, they, uh, in the old days, we talked about disabled people, the mentally retarded, but all these languages have been changed. Yes. People first language is a person with disability. Yes. So not a disabled person, because they are a person, but a person who has a disability, living with a disability, isn't it? Because you are. Handicapped. Handicapped, retarded, all those terms. Yeah. Differently abled. A person of colour. We're all persons of colour. I mean, take, pick your tone. That there's no, yeah, there's no such thing as a bad person, but there are people who do harm, right? Engage in, so you've got to distinguish the person and the action. And this is where it's like, um, you know, the guy in prison who said, you mean I can be a bad person and a good person in the same lifetime? That was too hard for his poor mind because he'd always been told he was a bad person. So therefore, in his mind, I am a bad person. Imagine how that constrains your life. And so then he read, you know, it was actually a Christian book he had about being a good person. I said, you can be a bad person, a good person in the same minute. I said, oh, that's too much. But that concept of being able to be, so this is where we can get unstuck and so his sense of himself is, I am a bad person. And so many people in prison, that is their sense of self. I'm a danger to society. Well, it may be true. It may be true. It doesn't have to be true tomorrow. It doesn't have to be always true. It is not permanent. This is because we can change absolutely everything. The Buddha said, there's nothing you've done that can't be purified in terms of the bad things. And we've all done in past lives. I know we're running out of time. Well, we've sort of run over a bit, five minutes. Okay. So just, um, you're happy. You're happy. So um, the instant changes, I think we'll talk about that in terms of the alternating current or the flickering of a mental image or a thought in mindfulness meditation, changes that happen instantly. We can't, like, how many thoughts, like they say, you know, we have 90,000, 70,000, however many thoughts in a day, karmic moments in a 64, in a finger snap and so forth and so forth. It's just way too quick. But we can, by those, we can perceive that, as we've said, you know, a thought arises, it abides, it goes away. So it's not a fixed thing in our mind. Because it's not fixed, it can change. So different ways to look at that. So as we familiarise with and penetrate the meaning of impermanence in relation to these five aggregates, the five rivers, the five aggregates, we can conclude there's nothing among, this is the whole point, the, amongst the aggregates, either body, feeling sensations or the composite factors of the mind that does not change in consciousness itself. So there's, we are empty of an unchanging self because there's nothing that doesn't change. So there's no such unchanging self, which is a good thing. We still exist and function. We don't have any need we don't need any unchanging self. Well, we don't have any unchanging self, so it's just, well, we don't need one. Okay. We couldn't become enlightened. Yeah, we couldn't develop our positive qualities. We couldn't have learned anything in this life if we were unchanging. Absolutely nothing. So what would be the point of having a human rebirth with human intelligence? Absolutely none. I mean, even the animals learn something. They do. In the insects, in the ants, social beings. 
Mm, it's fascinating. They're limited in what they can do, but we as humans are totally unlimited. I wanted to conclude. We want to conclude. <coughs> Okay, I'll read the two paragraphs. This is our conclusion, Dalai Lama. The benefit of insight is that it prevents us from attributing to objects a goodness or badness beyond which is actually there. Something to look forward to. This undermines our self-deception that makes it and makes it possible to reduce and eventually end lust and hatred since these Emotions are built on exaggerations. This elimination of unhealthy emotions leaves more room for healthy emotion and virtues to develop. By viewing phenomena with insight, you bring them within the scope of the practice of emptiness. When you practice expanding love and compassion, keep in mind that love and compassion themselves and the persons who are their objects are like a magician's illusion. They appear to exist solidly in of themselves, but they do not. If you see them as inherently existent, this view will keep you as inherently existent. This view will keep you from fully developing love and compassion. If you view them like illusions existing one way, appearing in another, this will enable you to both deepen your insight into emptiness and the healthy emotions of love and compassion and with such an understanding you can engage in effective compassionate activity so, way to go how to see yourself as you really are from the how to see I mean it's such a wonderful practical because then it goes on a meditation after that. And then each little section meditation after this. Okay, so a lot of food for thought for today. Pretty dense, huh? Okay, so I think that's our dedication. May we, you know, be able to cultivate the wisdom and the compassion, actually the insight for, that enables us to engage in compassionate deeds, which is the actions of a Buddha, for the benefit of all. Thank you very much. We'll see you in the morning. That's it? Yes. Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. See you tomorrow. See you. Bye-bye. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. Ciao. Um, shocking. Yes, Tim. Oh. There is, I had a pre-arrangement uh, pre, uh, tomorrow morning and I still think I might go to it. Um, but I, if I want to, uh, if, if you're recording tomorrow morning, yes. I'd, like, I'll, I'd like to be able to watch it on YouTube, yeah? Yeah, tomorrow will be on YouTube. Great. Yeah, okay. just I want to catch up. for the prayer of Oh, morning. actually, tomorrow might have to be on YouTube after, at 9.30. Just that half an hour. Just the first half hour won't be. And then after that, it'll be on YouTube. But then hopefully these Zoom recordings work and they'll at some point go up on YouTube. Anyway, we missed a little bit. Okay. Radio. Cheers. Take care, everybody. No problems.